Education Voices in the City of Wilmington became involved in a partnership to create Education Voices Incorporated. So before I go on, I want to uh, thank some folks that are in the audience now. Um, I want to thank uh, Council President Theo Gregory for facilitating this process and facilitating the creation of Education Voices. And I also want to thank City Council, Wilmington City Council, for helping in this process. Um, I want to acknowledge Councilman Michael Brown. Please stand, sir. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge one of our panelists, Councilman Nomni Chukucho. Chukwacha. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. I actually practiced that too. But, uh, and I understand that. Uh, these two city council people, the three people that are here, really fighters for education, actually uh, sort of grew up with uh, Councilman President Theo Gregg, man. I know he's a fighter. Um, and I know Michael Brown's a fighter. And I know that uh, Councilman Nomni Chucha is a fighter. Forgive me, please. <laughs> um, education Voice is created to advocate for parents, advocate for children and educate the community. Quite a task. Um, this is an important organization. I work in uh, Chester, Pennsylvania, and we don't have an organization like this in Chester. People pretty much have to advocate for themselves. Um, so this is very important. It's very important that we support this organization. Uh, and let me tell you why. Devin Henson, the executive director, is a fighter. He's a fighter. And when I first joined this organization as, the, as one of the board members, I would ask Devin to show me some of the cases, some of his clients, some of the things that are going on, some of the schools that he's visiting. And some of the things, some of the cases, some of the files that I looked at, it was disturbing. And I'm just going to tell it like it is. It was disturbing. It was things that were appalling, they were egregious violations that are still going on in some of our schools, especially with some of our special ed children. And it seems to point toward African-American males. And this, you know, that's not an emotional testimony for me. That's just fact. Numbers don't lie. They don't lie. We have a problem. And there's a connection between what's going on in these schools, in these classrooms, to what's going on in the streets. There's a connection there, so we can't overlook that. So I applaud all of you. I applaud all of you for coming out this morning, Saturday morning, because you could be doing a whole lot of other things, because it's nice outside. <laughs> Am I right? You could be doing a whole lot of other things, but you're here. You're here because you care. You're here because this is important work. And I can't tell you how important it is, and we have to support this organization. We have to support this organization, because like I said, there's a connection between this violence in the street and what's going on in the classrooms. If a child can't read, they can tell you. They can, they can tell you how many prison beds they need based on literacy. Based on literacy. By the time a child gets to the third grade, if they're not reading on grade level, it becomes very difficult and challenging for them as they move forward in their career. That says something. Not Dave Clark. Not talking from an emotional standpoint. I'm just giving you facts. I also want to thank Ms. Lynn Gregory, who, you know, when people volunteer to do work and they don't have to do it, you know, I got to take my hat off to them, especially something like this. This, this takes a lot. So I'd like to thank Ms. Gregory, Lynn Gregory, for helping put this together. She volunteered to put this together. Thank you. Finally, before uh, our president, city council, comes up, I want to acknowledge a couple people. Our moderator, thank you very much. Ray Avery Jones, we know, we're going back. She's a fighter. You know, you know Ray, she's a fighter. And she's committed. She's very committed. Um, I want to thank two board members that are here this morning, Saturday morning, Rose Wooten and Mary Ford. We go back. Thank you, thank you for your, uh, your commitment. And certainly want to thank the panelists and Dr. Howard for being here. And finally, I want to thank my man, 
soldier. The one man army, we need, we need more Devin Hensons. Okay, we need more. We need to make sure we have more. Because he's in it. He's in the fight. Mr. Henson, please stand. Thank you. As I look around the room, I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. Mr. Gregory, please. I, I guess I'm a firm believer in Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it can. It, it will. So we try to be perfect in all other regards. But we didn't anticipate a, a bike race this morning. So, so we want to thank everybody for coming out. And certainly this is uh, very, very important. Uh, you were given a book this morning called Strengthening Wilmington Education uh, in Action Agenda. In there, there's a call for an Office of Education and Public Policy in the city of Wilmington. Uh, let me tell you how that would work, and it's very important to what we're doing. When we talk about education, we talk about the federal government, we talk about state government, we talk about the Department of Education, we talk about Rodale Foundation, and we talk about the Cesar Rodney Institute. Nowhere in that dialogue do we talk about the city of Wilmington. Uh, in, in 1978 or so, the, uh, we went to DSAG, and before that, the, there was an erosion of the Old Wilmington School Board, which was divorced for the city of Wilmington. But how do we become players and how do we put our own action plans and philosophies and policies in place from an urban standpoint? Uh, so there is a recommendation in the report for an Office of Education and Public Policy. And that's going to require some politics. First, the General Assembly would have to pass enabling legislation that would allow us to raise funds. That's the thinking. Now, in 1978, our wage tax was 1.5%. 1 1.5%. .5%. In 1978, with DSAG, it went to 1.25%. Uh, they took the other 2.25%, saying that since you're not in the education business anymore, you don't need that money. So we would like to get that money back. That's $11 million that we would get back, $11 million. And I'm suggesting that that would be tied to education. It would be earmarked specifically for education in the city of Wilmington. Uh, if we get that, then we, create, we can create the office now, but with that enabling legislation coming to the city, then that would permit us to raise our wage tax. And wage, wage tax, and the thinking would be, we would raise it in some increment, up 2.25% to raise monies for this program. Let me give you an example of what we could do. We could actually put a pre-K through third grade school in place without the impediments of either the state or federal government with about three to four million dollars of that. That would be our school uh, held to our standards in moving through just as a private school or a Catholic school or a Christian school. That's what we could do. It's just the same as homeschooling kids. No state or federal involvement and I think that that would be a good thing. The, the shame of it would be we'll probably do a better job than what's being done now so uh, then, then you have to compare, do you need all that stuff and all those impediments that those folk put in place? Or if the urban community is given a straight shot to educate its kids, they would in fact succeed. So um, with that, I'm very thankful that you're here. Uh, again, best laid plans of mice and men often go astray. You know, we thought through this over about a three month process and I guess we never looked at the calendar to see what else was happening in downtown Wilmington on a Saturday morning in May. Usually nothing, but this is the day where something is happening. But thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I agree with Councilman, uh, City Council President Gregory. I thank everybody for coming out today. We know that there's other things you could have been doing, um, and I just appreciate your support um, and your interest in, in trying to make sure that urban children um, receive a free and appropriate public education. Anybody that knows me knows I'm a fighter. I'm not necessarily a public speaker. So I wrote down something just to give you a little bit of history of the organization and, and basically how we've been functioning since 2013. Um, education Voices Inc. officially established as a nonprofit in 2013 and has the primary goal of benefiting the city of Wilmington through reducing the number of discipline-based student school exclusions, um, i.e. Ex expulsions and suspensions, decreasing dropout rates, strengthening special education services, and increase in school parent 
community relationships. In addition, the organization is committed to and will work to increase parent participation and disseminate information in regards to public education practices, policies, and procedures. Most importantly, EVI has developed a level of excellence in special education advocacy. Our special education advocacy has assisted families with obtaining the following special education services for their children. Identification, evaluation, and eligibility for special ed services, implementation of 504 plans and accommodations, and IEP interventions and supports. Development of IEP intervention supports and accommodations, and development of behavior intervention plans, and then most importantly, those that are in education uh, understand this, the data collection that's associated with those behavior plans. We supported a little over 70 families in 2014, and for those 70 families, we reached a positive and measurable outcome. However, in 2015, as of yesterday, we have helped 82 families with the same outcomes. So basically, So basically, we're on target to do close to double what we did last year. In closing, I would like to thank all of you for coming. You could have been anywhere in the world this morning, but you were interested enough to participate in this conversation about trends in urban education, and more specifically, more specifically the city of Wilmington. Again, thank you. Before I introduce uh, Joe Garcia, who will uh, present and introduce our guest speaker, whom I'm waiting can't wait to, to listen to and hear um, Dr. Howard. I just want to make one comment. Think about, think about what would happen if we didn't have organizations like this and we didn't have good teachers. I say good teachers. Think about if they didn't exist. You think it's bad now? Think about the outcome. Think about exactly what that would look like. And it just looks to me, it looks horrifying. You know, so again, I really appreciate you being here. I really do. But we have to continue to grow because this, to me, when I look out, this means that we are the base. We are the base and we have to continue to fight. Mr. Garcia, please come up and introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. A very distinguished speaker today, Dr. Uh, Tyrone C. Howard. Uh, Dr. Howard graduated from the University of California with a bachelor's degree in 1990. That was followed by a master's degree in education from California State University and then a PhD from the University of Washington. Uh, uh, Dr. Howard started off as a classroom teacher in the Compton Consolidated School District. He became a, a faculty member of the College of Education at Ohio State University. And then after that, for, let, for the past 14 years, Dr. Howard has been a member of the UCLA faculty in the Graduate School of Education and the Information Studies Urban Schooling Division. It's a mouthful. Uh, Dr. Howard is presently the director of Center X, a consortium of urban professionals working towards social justice and educational equity in transforming the Los Angeles schools. Dr. Howard is also the director and founder of the Black Male Institute at UCLA an interdisciplinary cadre of scholars, community members, and policy, and policy members dedicated to improving the educational experience and life chances of black males. Dr. Howard's book, Race, Culture, and the Achievement Gap, is a Teachers College Press bestseller publication. His most recent book, Black Mailed is also a bestseller. All told, Dr. Howard 
has published over 75 peer-reviewed publications. In 2015, Dr. Howard received the UCLA Distinguished Faculty Award, the highest honor provided to teaching excellence. He was recently awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award for exemplary research and diversity by the American Education Research Association, the nation's largest and most prestigious educational research, research organization. Without further ado, um, I'd like to have Dr. Uh, Howard come up and speak to us today. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We gotta do a little bit better than that. I'm still on West Coast time. Good morning. Good morning. I need y'all to help wake me up. Uh, thank Joe for that warm introduction. I also want to thank each and every one for being here this morning. As it has been said by others, uh, there are a lot of things you could be doing this morning, like riding bikes in the streets, right? <laughs> but you have chosen to be here to talk about and to engage in this very important work around education. I also want to thank all the folks with EVI who have made this possible. Uh, I see Council President uh, Theo Gregory, who I got to know yesterday, uh, real fighter for justice and educational equality. I appreciate your, your commitment to the, the, the vision behind this work. Uh, Devin Henson, uh, another uh, visionary who has been, who's committed to doing this work. We had a chance to talk yesterday, and I appreciate it and love the passion and the commitment that you all bring to this work. Um, I'm not going to bore you. I'm going to try to engage you in the brief time I have before we move into our conversation uh, with the panelists around how we respond to this, but I am, I am oftentimes um, aware of a statement by Malcolm X, who was one of my ideological heroes. And Malcolm X said that education uh, is a passport to the future, uh, but tomorrow is for those who prepare for it today. And if we are to believe Malcolm's statement that education is a passport for the future, to be frank with us folks, we are in some serious trouble. Uh, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, I don't want to sugarcoat it. I don't want to mix words. I just want us to understand the se sense of urgency we need to understand around what is happening in our schools. Uh, you all saw what happened uh, a couple of weeks back, not too far from here in Baltimore, uh, and the unfortunate uh, passing, murder, killing of Mr. Freddie Gray led to a number of different uprisings. Uh, not only in Baltimore, but other parts of the country. Uh, I think what happened there in many ways is symbolic of a larger set of issues that we have got to start paying attention to. Uh, I think what those young folks were trying to convey, this is just my own interpretation, what they are trying to convey, what they were trying to convey is that, that they are participating in a system that they feel like is broken, a system that doesn't recognize their humanity a system that does not seem to offer them hope at a time when so many other folks are making the American dream their reality. Uh, and part of what we have to recognize is that the means that they use, you can question, but you cannot dampen the message that they were trying to convey. And when you get young people who are hopeless, young people who feel like there's no way out, they will resort to certain kinds of means that tells folks that this is not working. Uh, I was in Baltimore just about two weeks ago, had a chance to talk to a number of the young folks who were there, and you can hear the frustration, you can hear the pain, you can hear the misery, you can hear the suffering from young people telling us that schools as they are set up don't work. Uh, schools as they are set up don't recognize their needs. Schools as they are set up don't seem to have their best interests at heart. Uh, you all know this, I mean we all, how many folks here watch The Wire, right? The Wire was telling the staff for how many years, right? So what I'm surprised by is that so much of the country seemed to be surprised at what was going on in Baltimore. Uh, and unfortunately, what is going on in Baltimore is no different than what's going on in Chicago or Los Angeles or New York or Miami uh, or, or Gary, Indiana or St. Louis or Chicago. And the list goes on and on and on, right? Is that when you continue to have economic deprivation, we don't give folks access to jobs and employment, uh, we see this vicious cycle of hopelessness that is happening in our schools across this country. What we know is this, every year, 1.4 million children, they say drop out of schools, I say we push them out of schools. 1.4 million 
Disproportionately, what we know is those young people are black and brown. Disproportionately, what we also know is those children are poor. So there are some conversations that we have to have in our schools about race and about poverty that we don't want to have. Uh, we don't want to have those conversations because I think to do so means we have to face the fact that there are some real deep-seated structural problems in our country that are not making the problem better, but in many ways making the problem worse. And that's what we have to come to grips with, right? So when we talk about poverty, for example, what we know in this country is that we have over 15 million young people who live in poverty every single day in this country. Uh, five million of those young people who live in what is considered extreme poverty. What is extreme poverty? Household of four with an income, household income of less than $8,000, right? So these are the young people who show up in our schools here in Delaware every single day that we still have these standards for that does not take into account their considerations and concerns and their reality at home, right? So you imagine for a second what it's like for a family of four to have to exist on a household income of $8,000, right? Think about that for a second, right? So part of what we have to recognize is that you all, I know Delaware was one of these states that were, were, were caught up in this race to the top funding, right? You, you received it, but part of the challenge from where I sit and where I saw this is that the race to the top funding intensified what the expectations were for outcomes, right? And intensifying those standards did not seem to take into context the reality of where young people are, right? And you cannot fix these problems overnight. So you can't say we want high standards for all students, but not be concerned about the real life on the ground circumstances that young people and their families deal with every day, right? See, I speak about this because this is my reality, much like many of you all can relate to. See, part of what folks don't seem to understand or they don't care about is the fact that we have a reality where you got young folks who come to school every morning, oftentimes not having had any breakfast that morning, right? In some cases, not having had dinner the previous night, right? Oftentimes being exposed to all kind of traumatic and violent situations. For us to ignore that and act as if it does not exist, I think it's outright irresponsible, right? So part of what we have to do in this room, it's okay to clap for it, right? We gotta call it what it is. Part of what we have to do is tell the story of those who don't have a platform to tell their story, right? Part of those folks who don't have the platform to tell their story don't, can't talk about the fact that you have how many single parents out there raising three kids on a minimum wage income, right? Making ends meet the best way they know how. Some of these parents holding two and sometimes three jobs, right? Working on the weekend, working a midnight shift. See, I was one of these kids. My mother was 18 years old when she had me. Right? So when I talk about these issues, this is not just something that I'm interested in. Like many of you, this is something I live firsthand. My mother was 18 years old. I'm in Compton, California. People don't expect folks in Compton, California, much like they don't expect young folks in Wilmington, Delaware, to grow up to be much at all. Right? The statistics tell us that you are more likely to do what? Drop out, go to jail, incarceration, decease. All those things are supposed to happen more likely than it is to be, for you to be on a graduation stage for high school, let alone college, right? But see, part of what happens is that people would talk about the fact that, look, we have back to school night, we have open house. My mother could not come to that. Why not? My mother was working, right? My mother worked a, a, a 3 p.m. to midnight graveyard shift every night, never called in sick, was there every day. So don't tell me that parents don't care about young people's education. Because the same parents we're saying don't care are working two jobs, doing everything they can to keep a roof over the head of their children, right? The same parents that we say don't care are the ones who are going without so their children can have a little bit of something to make their day-to-day their, 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 their -day reality a little bit better, right? So part of what I have to help folks understand is that the problems we have to face is that poverty is real, right? Poverty causes some circumstances that we don't like to talk about. And what bothers me is when you look at special education across this country, in many ways, I don't think it's really about children who have learning problems. I think it's more about just warehousing kids that, that teachers don't want to deal with, right? And there's a high degree of young people, right? Let's talk about it. There's a high degree, and you might disagree with me, and I, we can engage in it, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the fight, right? But the reality is this. The reality is this. Look, when you look at special education across this country, you tell me these kids can't learn, I will say that there is some kind of a sixth sense that you have to have when you grow up poor. Right? There is a sense that people don't recognize. There is a talent there when you have to grow up without, right? Because you learn how to survive. Yeah. You learn how to struggle. 
you learn how to, to make a way out of no way, right? I always tell folks who have a little, bit of, a little bit of money, let me see if you can live for one day, one day, let alone one hour, right? Let me take your cell phone away from you. Let me take your credit cards away from you. Let me see if you can survive for one hour in some of the circumstances that these young people live in every single day. You couldn't do it. Couldn't do it, right? I watch schools that I, walk, I, I, I visit, right? I'm always intrigued by schools when the bell rings at 3 o'clock. You see teachers beating kids out of the school, right? They're trying to leave before the kids do because they don't want to have to experience what it is that young people experience every single day. So when you talk about gifted and talented, to me, I would be willing to bet that half the kids who are in special education, those are your gifted and talented kids. We just don't give them a chance. We don't give them a chance to show their gifts and talents, right? We talk about gifted and talented. You show me the mother who has four kids and raising her, uh, not only her four kids, but her niece and her nephew, right? And in some cases, now we've got more of our, our grandparents raising children, right? Raising great-grandchildren. You show me that parent who's, who's getting by on minimal income every single month, but yet still those kids show up to school every day with clothes on their back, doing the best that they can. That's the gifted and talented right there, right? But we don't recognize that mother or that grandmother. So part of what we have to recognize is that just because people grow up impoverished does not mean that they have an impoverished spirit does not mean that they have an impoverished will, right? There are too many folks, let me just call it what it is, too many folks who are in our schools who believe that kids who are poor cannot learn. Too many folks who believe that kids who are poor cannot be successful. Uh, they will not say it outright, but it's evident in their actions, right? You talk to young people, go to any school across Delaware, the United States, and you spend about five minutes talking to students and ask them who are the teachers who don't care. And they can tell you, just like that, right? Because they will tell you it's about the fact that when you walk into those classrooms, those teachers have virtually no expectation for those students to learn, right? See, part of what we have to understand is this. Look, at the end of the day, we need to have educators who have the best interests of our students at heart. If they don't do that, then we have to have a serious conversation about how we get those folks out of this, out of this work. The stakes are too high, right? Stakes are too high. And unfortunately, what we have is a reality where we have educators many of whom don't come from the communities in which they teach, many of them don't understand the communities in which they teach, and therefore they have a, a, a set of expectations that says that if these kids fail, it's not my problem, right? See, we need more teachers like the one I had in fifth grade. I always talk about my fifth grade teacher, Miss Russell, right? Miss Russell was one of those old school, no nonsense kind of educators, right? She always told us every single day in this classroom, you will learn, right? She said, if you don't learn, that means I've not taught it, right? I tell people all the time, throughout my fifth grade year, we may have had recess maybe half a dozen times. We did not play because Ms. Russell said, you cannot play. You will not go to recess if you cannot spell recess, she used to tell us, right? Part of what the reality was, Ms. Russell had this firm belief, this firm belief that whether you were black, brown, blue, red, green, or yellow, in her classroom, you were going to learn. And I cannot tell you the power of having a teacher who tells you every single day, you will learn. You will learn. And let me show you how you will learn. That woman put countless hours into our education, kept us after school, made us come on Saturday mornings, right? She was invested in our future because she realized that if she failed us, that she was failing her job and her responsibilities as an educator. And she lived in Compton knowing that if we then became failures, that the city would become a failure, right? See, part of what we have to do is find out how we get people to understand that their fate is connected to the young people that they teach, right? And until we do that, we're going to have problems. So un as I understand it, oftentimes the folks in Brandywine don't see the issues in red clay as their problem, right? How does that happen? See, a part of what we have to understand is that the so-called suburban problems, the so-called suburban reality, I, I don't know how we talk about this issue around suburban education because now we're starting to see urban issues in suburban communities, right? So I always tell folks, you can run from us, but you cannot hide, right? Because we will find you, right? And now what's interesting to me is to see suburban communities now all of a sudden up and on because they got a few poor kids in their schools. They bring down the property value, right? They're messing up our, our test scores, right? Welcome to our world. This is the world we've been living in for years. So part of what we have to understand is that we have some poverty issues, but we also have some racial problems. And that's the conversation we don't want to have, right? Here you are, we're in a district right now where what we have, I looked at your data, you have like close, over 90% of your students are non-white. 
74% are African American. How can we have a district where most of the kids are black and brown and not have conversations about race, right? You look at the outcome data. It's outright dismal, right? It's not just a Delaware problem. This is a, this is a U.S. problem, right? We look at who is starting school late. It is us, right? We talk about early childhood education, which we see in the, in the action agenda, which is important, but we know black kids get just as much access to early childhood education as white children. The difference is that the quality of their early childhood education is not the same. So if you go to where we send our children, unfortunately, there's far more babysitting and a lot less learning than there should be, right? We have uncredentialed teachers in those classrooms where we have early childhood education. So what happens is our young people leave pre-K, still not knowing how to identify letters, still not knowing how to identify numbers, shapes and sizes, all the kinds of things that we know that should be happening in pre-K, right? So then they start kindergarten already behind, right? And now, again, you know race to the top. What I think race to the top has done in these other education reform agendas, they have almost compressed all the standards of what, expect, what we expect young people to learn. So now what you look at as a kindergarten set of educational standards are what I would say are second and third grade standards in all actuality, right? See, part of what these standards don't take into consideration is the fact that we have to have developmentally appropriate standards, okay? You cannot ask four and five-year-old children to do things that seven and eight-year-old children should do. And don't give me this whole excuse about, well, kids in the Netherlands, they're doing it, right? Or, or kids in China are doing it, right? Uh, Council President Gregory and I had this conversation yesterday. I think that's a flawed argument when we compare our children to what happens in other countries across the world. Why? Because here in this country, education is compulsory. We take everybody. You have to go, right? Those other countries, they selectively choose who goes to school, right? So we compare apples to oranges. We look at kids in the Netherlands and Finland and Sweden and say, wow, how can their kids are scoring at the 90th percentile? Because they only educate certain portions of their student population. So let's compare apples to apples. So part of what we have to do is get the early childhood education piece right. And what we know is that we're pushing out kids as early as preschool. U.S. Department of Education had a report that says that half of the suspensions, half of the suspensions in preschool are black children. Think about that. I don't know what you can do in preschool, <laughs> in preschool that, re that requires you to get kicked out, but it's happening, right? We see these cases now where you got educators, teachers, principals calling the police yeah. to deal with five-year-olds, four-year-olds, right? There's a case in Colorado that happened. Young four-year-old young girl would not listen to the teacher. Teacher told the principal, the principal calls the law enforcement. They, they send five police cars, eight police officers to deal with a four-year-old young child. I don't understand that, but this is what is happening. We got black kids who are only roughly 15% of all preschool age children, but half of the kids were being pushed out, preschool. And let me tell you this, folks, you know how it goes. Once the label is put on you, yes. once the label is put on you, it does not come off. So when we talk about reading and literacy, part of what we have to understand is that when we take kids out of school, they're missing quality instructional time to get the kinds of skills and knowledge that they need to be successful. So that's why, to me, it's not surprising, but it's outright criminal when we get to third grade, as Dr. Clark mentioned, right? We look at third grade reading scores across the nation, and it tells us that black kids, only 20% are reading at grade level by grade three. 20%. I mean, we should be up in arms about that. I ask the question, what would this country do if 20% of white kids were reading at grade level by grade three? I think we'd have special task force, we have, we have interventions. I think we have conveyed the message that certain lives matter more than others. When 80% of your children are reading by grade level, we can almost predict the numbers who will not graduate in the next eight, nine years after that, right? So what do we do? How do we respond? We gotta start having these conversations about race and racism because it's real, it's in our schools, it's in our country. I don't buy this idea. I work with a lot of schools. Educators tell me, you know what? I don't see color, I see children. Stop it, stop it, stop it, right? We see children, we see color every single day. And for us to act as if colorblindness is a way to think about this is a wrong step to take, right? Acknowledge the fact that in a school district where half your kids are black, but 90% of those who are, who are being kicked out are black, that's a problem. We should start raising some questions, right? We have to recognize the fact that, look, 
there's a big elephant in the middle of the room. 85% of our classroom teachers are white, middle class, monolingual, and most of them have grown up not in the same context around non-white people. That's our reality. So I think you have well-intentioned, well-meaning educators who just don't understand black kids, brown kids, poor kids. Again, well-intentioned, but just misinformed. So when we wonder why we have so many kids who are pushed out, suspended, expelled, I think we have a serious, what I call cultural disconnect children just not being understood by their teachers, right? <laughs> children not being understood by their teachers. And part of what I have to tell folks is how is it that you have some young people in a classroom who are consistently being pushed out, kicked out? I was a classroom teacher. I know how it goes. The door was stocked. People start knocking on my door about 8.30, 15 minutes into the day. Mr. Howard, can you take this one? Can you take this one? Can you take this one? Right? Exporting the problem. Same young man, same young girl comes into my class. We have no problems at all because there's an understanding of what I expect of you, right? We have an understanding. I communicate my expectation to you. We're clear. I'm going to treat you with a degree of humanity. We have no problem. But people try to tell me, well, if the kids are bad, if the kids are bad, they're going to be bad wherever they go. Why is it that they give me no problems in my classroom, but then in your, in your classroom, they're problems? Right? Not understanding children. So we have to have some system-wide, district-wide conversations around cultural competence so we can help educators understand the way culture manifests everything that we do, the way we speak, the way we think, the way we communicate, the way we process is a part of our reality. We have, again, well-intentioned teachers who just don't understand our students. I always tell the story about my young, many years ago, my son was four years old in a preschool classroom, his teacher, well-meaning white teacher, well-meaning white, I'm gonna keep saying that, well-meaning, but just misinformed and culturally disconnected, right? She insisted to tell me the fact that he didn't, he couldn't do the math and the reading that they were doing in the classroom. I'm like, what do you mean he can't do it? This is the same young child who's doing these same things for me at home. She said, well, he's not quite ready yet. Uh-oh, what do you mean he's not ready yet, right? She said, well, I asked him to come join us the other day when we got ready to do our letter of the day. He said he didn't want to join us. And I encouraged him to come over and sit down when we did our letter of the day. He didn't want to join us. So I'm listening to her talk about how she asked him to come sit down at the table. <laughs> she encouraged him to come sit down at the table, right? See, the, the issue was my son was loving preschool, right? Why? Because he had choices. So he was like, okay, you're asking me if I want to come join you. No, I don't, right? You're, encour you're encouraging me, you're encouraging me to come sit down. If you encourage me, that means I don't have to do it, right? So this is what she was saying, right? She said, and once I suggested to him that what he should do, I said, you suggested to my four-year-old child? <laughs> right? I said, part of the challenge is here, look, teacher, the way you communicate with my child is not working. Because at home, I don't encourage him to go to bed, <laughs> right? I don't suggest that he come down and eat dinner, right? What you have to understand in this household, it's not a democracy. You don't have choices, right? We communicate very directly with our children. Get your butt here, eat, then go to bed, right? It's just the way we communicate. She tried to explain to me, well, you know, the Montessori approach to school, you have to give kids choices and options and, oh, stop, stop. For this young black boy, you need to tell him, come, sit down. This is what I need you to do. She tried it the next day, had no problem from him whatsoever, right? Did everything, did everything that she asked him to do. I always use that case in point to say, what would have happened if I had not intervened on my son's behalf, right? This is what happens to young black boys in this country every single day, had nothing to do with his cognition, had everything to do with culture and communication. If I don't intervene on my son's behalf, at some point in time, his teacher is going to evaluate him. And we know what she might say about him, right? Not really uh, a motivated learner, uh, can't do simple academic tasks. Uh, you know, maybe he has ADHD. I think we put that label on more black children than we want to admit. And I'm willing to bet that 60 to 70 percent of those cases are inaccurate, right? So part of what would have happened, my son would have gotten the label put on him. And it had nothing to do with his ability, but everything to do with the way that his teacher communicated with him not understanding my child, right? And we need to have more of our children who are having advocates on their behalf. That's what EVI is about, right? You have too many parents. Look, too many parents who go into IEP meetings not knowing what those things are being said to them, right? First of all, half of them don't know what an IEP is, what it means, 
right? We have illegal IEPs that happen. First and foremost, you cannot have an IEP unless a parent or a caregiver or a guardian has approved for it to happen in the first place. But they happen and parents have no clue what's going on. We put out a plan of action for a child and the parent is completely unaware of the fact that it's happening, right? So we have to have some, uh, some, some empowerment and, uh, and awareness with our parents to help them to understand that, look, your children are bright and talented and gifted, but yet still school districts don't recognize those gifts and talents. You know, I tell the story, I was in a, in a I mean, we talk about this ADHD label, and then what we do when we give this label of ADHD, we, we then want to medicate children. And I think we over-medicate in this country. I was in a school district in Ohio. I told this story just a few weeks ago. A school district in Ohio, elementary school. The bell rang about 10 o'clock in the morning. I thought it was the bell for the kids to go out to recess, but it was not. What happened, about seven or eight kids came out of each classroom, and they lined up at the nurse's station. Very politely, no pushing, no fighting. They all lined up without adult supervision. And I kept thinking, what is, what is going on here? They lined up at the nurse's station. The nurse then went through a whole process of giving every child his or her medication. Gave them a small cup with some kind of Ritalin or, or Adderall, whatever they give these students. Students took their two or three pills, took their cup of water, went back to class. There was about 60 kids, most of them black children, who were being medicated right there on the school premises. What does that mean when we over-medicate our children? Because we as educators don't want to think outside the box, engage them, stimulate them, right? Create culturally responsive learning environments. So part of what we have to do is to fix this. We need to become more advocate oriented, right? We got to fix this early childhood conundrum we have and get the right kind of folks in those classrooms. We got to have parent community engagement, right? See, part of the issue is we tell parents that they don't matter. We blame parents for being the problem. And then we wonder why they don't show up at schools. My thing is we got to make schools inviting places for parents, tell them that they matter, their voices are important. They have solutions that can help us, right? Part of what we also have to have are these wraparound services, right? See, part of, look, we all took Psychology 101, did we not? Psychology 101 told us, we, took a, we talked about Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow said that you cannot get to higher order cognitive thinking and needs until what? Basic needs are met. Basic needs being food, shelter, concern, love, care. Part of what we have to recognize is that many of our young people are walking into classrooms and they are not whole. They are not healed. They are experiencing more trauma than we want to acknowledge. The Department of Children and Family Services tells us that one in four kids are the victims of some type of physical, emotional, verbal, abuse, one in four. And what the Department of Children and Family Services tells us is that for every one case that we know about, there's another one case that should be reported, but it's not. So do the math for a second, folks. That means two out of four. That means half. That means the schools that you all work in, the schools that you all serve, we have young people who walk in who are victims of all type of violence, abuse, neglect, trauma. For us to think that we can then ask these children to walk into a classroom, put all that stuff aside and open up their books to start reading, I think it's unrealistic and unfair and inhumane. My wife is a children's social worker and she tells me about these cases every single day and they are enough to bring you to tears to see what young people are having to deal with on a regular basis in our country. She's got a case right now, young 11 year old girl, lives with mom, three younger siblings. Mom meets a guy, boyfriend, moves the boyfriend in, the boyfriend's going to help her raise the kids. Sounds good on the surface, right? But we know the reality is, boyfriend's not working, mom is off to work, two jobs. Mom says that all of a sudden, she's not there as much. The young 11-year-old child says that the boyfriend begins to start physically, sexually abusing the young girl. Tells the young girl that if you say anything about this to anybody, I will hurt you, your siblings, and your mother. So this young 11-year-old child has been carrying this pain and this misery for close to seven, eight months. Going to school every day. Being violated in the most just, just unimaginable way you can even think about, right? The young girl finally musters up the courage to tell her mom what the boyfriend is doing to her. Mom doesn't believe it. Mom says she's making it up, trying to come between her and her boyfriend, puts the little girl out. 
Now she's a victim of not only sexual abuse, now she's homeless, right? We don't want to talk about this homeless issue we have in our schools. See, part of what we have to recognize, that child walks into school every single day broken, right? Until we put more wraparound services in schools, and what I mean by that, we should have social workers in every single school, school psychologists in every single school, right? We cannot, we cannot expect excellent academic outcomes, but yet still let young people walk around with trauma that goes untreated, right? See, but to me, that still shows the level of resilience that our students show every single day. So you got young people who are walking in facing all kinds of horrific situations, but they still come to school to learn. So when we wonder why kids are neglected, we wonder why they're angry, we wonder why they're oftentimes disconnected, we have got to take time to connect. I tell every educator who will listen that your most important job as an educator is to build relationships, right? Relationships matter. Listen to children, learn from children. When you build relationships, there is no limit to what you can do with young folks. Why is it that the football and the basketball coaches connect with these young men in ways that their teachers cannot? Right? Relationships mean that you then don't judge these children. You see their potential. You see their gifts and talents. So we've got to have wraparound services in schools, right, on site that can help children deal with the kinds of trauma and the emotional neglect that they're dealing with every single day. Then we also got to have conversations about the kind of teachers we need to have in, in schools. Far too, many, far too many schools have underqualified teachers who are not equipped to teach in the communities that we're oftentimes talking about, who don't know their content, don't understand pedagogy, don't know how to connect with young people. We see a big influx of career changers, folks who are in industry, private industry. Just because you are an engineer, just because you know math and science, does not mean that you can teach it, right? So we have to have a long and hard conversation about who we let into the teaching profession and then how we start to counsel folks out of the profession because the stakes are too high to have folks who are incompetent to do what they do to young children every single day in this country. I talked about racism being real. Let's talk about it. I talked about the fact that 85% of our classroom teachers are white. But when it comes to racism in schools, racism in classrooms, let me be clear about this. White teachers do not have the exclusive on being bad for black children, OK? And that's the conversation that we don't want to have. There are black and brown teachers who are equally as culpable in this as white teachers are, right? We talk about racism, we're talking about an ideology, a mindset. And I see black and brown teachers who do far more harm in some cases, far more harm to black and brown children than white teachers do. So let's not get caught up in, let's blame all the white teachers, right? And yet we see black and brown teachers committing the same kind of egregious acts with our children. It goes across the board. We got to call bad teaching on the carpet, no matter if it's a white teacher, a black teacher, an Asian teacher, a Hispanic teacher. We have to call it to, to the, uh, we got to call it on the carpet because it happens across the board. So we have to have this conversation about teachers, but we can only have that conversation when we look at the school leaders who we put in there in the first place. Okay? Because the school leaders tend to find folks who do what? Who share their ideology and their approaches to how they should think about school. Some of the school principals should not be there. Right? Because they have this belief that somehow certain students cannot learn. Certain students won't learn. This deficit thinking is so prevalent in our schools and communities. This idea that these kids, because they're poor, can't learn. These kids, because they come from single parent households, can't learn. These kids now, because they speak a language other than English, can't learn. These kids who are foster kids can't learn. Right? If you were to go through that list of folks who basically come from these different categories, that probably would make up close to half of the folks in this room. That would mean we would not be here, right? But there was somebody somewhere who did not give up on us, and that's why we are here doing what we do today. We cannot forget that, okay? We cannot forget that. Part of what we have to do is start having these courageous conversations. We have to start having folks understand that they are part of the problem. Right? Part of the problem. Many of you work with these folks. You see these folks. And we kind of tiptoe around the issue. We don't want to tackle it head on. We don't want to offend folks. We don't want to make them uncomfortable. I say, look, why? Why? Our children are uncomfortable in schools every single day. Right? No one thinks about that. Our children are having to hear things that are offensive to them every single day. Right? And we're okay with that. So why do we spare adults of the same things that our young people hear on a regular basis? You spend a little time talking to students. We got a big project right now. We're talking to over 3,500 young people in schools across this country. And some of the things these young people are saying will just, I mean, it will anger you beyond belief. Things that are being said to them by 
educators, things that are being said about them by adults in the school, right? You're going to end up on crack just like your mother, right? You're not going to amount to anything anyway, so why should I care, right? I'm going to get my paycheck whether you learn or not, so I don't care. These are things that kids are telling us every single day now that the adults say to them. Then we wonder why kids are angry. We wonder why students are upset. See, I always say, give me the kids any day of the week. I'll deal with young folks. I'll deal with young folks. It's the grown-ups that's the challenge at times, right? It's the grown-ups, right? And I don't want to sugarcoat it. Look, are there some kids who have some challenges? Absolutely they are, right? When I was a teacher, I had them. But what I've always maintained is that that same child who was cutting up, who was angry, who's all over the place in the classroom, when you take that child one-on-one, -on -one, he becomes a different individual because these children are just, just, just begging for attention, begging for someone to care about them, begging for someone to say that you matter, begging for someone to say that you are important. So how is it that when you give this child a little bit of time, a little bit of love, a little bit of attention, all of a sudden that child becomes a completely different individual, right? Because he knows that you are willing to listen and not judge, right? To hear and not pass judgment, right? To see his or her potential and not give up. Part of what I say our problem is, folks, I mean, the late Asa Hilliard said this all the time. He said, we have the skill. The question is, do we have the will, right? I mean, when we ask what needs to happen to make education work, we know the answer, right? If we put the proper kind of investments in the, in the schools, we spend in this country about, what, $12,000 a year per pupil, but we spend about $45,000 per inmate, right? So our priorities are all mixed up. We'd rather spend money to incarcerate than to educate. Right? If we put the proper kinds of supports into schools with wraparound services, we engage parents, we engage communities, you get your different nonprofit organizations connected. I'm of the belief now that we can have better outcomes outside of school than we can in some cases inside of school. It pains me to say that because I look at what is happening in after school programs, boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, those places are bringing in kids in the, in the hundreds, right? I have kids we're talking to right now say, I don't go to school, but I go to the after school program at the boys and girls club, right? So what is happening in non-education -edu spaces, traditional education spaces that we can learn from? But you start to create those nonprofit connections, community-based organizations, you get your different social and health service programs and, and organizations connected to the Department of Education, tied in with city and state government. When you do those kinds of things, you can start to move the needle. So we know what works. The question is, do we have the political will to do what's right on behalf of children? And I'm beginning to raise, raise the question about whether or not we just don't care anymore, right? We talked about this earlier, right, Doc? We said the fact is at the end of the day, either folks don't know or folks don't care about what's happening with young people. And we can continue to turn a blind eye to young people if we want to, but if you see what happened in Baltimore a few weeks ago, we are coming closely to a moment in this country where we're going to have mass uprisings of young people in this country. Right? We don't like to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. But believe you me, young people are telling us that they are tired of playing the game the way we ask them to play it, but the game does not give them a realistic shot of winning. Right? I was talking to a young brother in Baltimore just a few weeks ago. He said, look, he said, I was scared. He said, but at the end of the day, he said, I thought that folks were going to take over because you had a lot of people who just didn't care. When you have young people who get to that point who, they, who just don't care, and it happens in so many different cities across the country, you are slowly creeping on a moment where you're going to have a tipping point. When you've got children who walk out of schools in mass, who tell you that they are hopeless and they feel helpless, right? When you have children who say that teachers and educators don't care, they are sending a powerful message to us loud and clear that something is not right in the system, right? And part of what concerns me is that this has been happening in black and brown communities for a very long time. But what we're starting to see is that even now in poor white communities, the same thing is starting to happen. I was in, in, in Kentucky, Appalachia, right? Same kinds of issues. Poor white families are saying, look, the game seems rigged. The game seems rigged, right? I am in no better place in 2015 than my mother and father were 30 years ago. I'm in no better place in 2015 than my grandparents were 60 years ago, right? I'm in no better place than my great-grandparents were 90 years ago. When people feel like we are not making progress, but we're playing by the rules, we're making the right choices, all those things, something is wrong with the system, right? My good friend Mike Rose, there was an article yesterday in the Washington Times as I prepare to close that talked about grit, right? Part of what I hear a lot of teachers saying that these poor kids just have to have more grit. They need to try harder. They need to be more perseverant. They need to just not give up, right? 
That is such a flawed argument to me because we're asking kids to try harder, to do more, when we as adults give them less. You tell me to try hard when I haven't had any food in my stomach for the last 12 hours. Right? You tell me to try hard when I have to walk into a school that's overcrowded and underfunded. Right? See, we compare these poor kids. We don't tell the rich kids to have more grit because they have all the resources that they need. Right? So we talk about grit. We need to have our kids have grit only when the schools and the educational and, and political systems that serve them also have more grit. Grit to say that we're going to fund them at a higher level, not at the same level, at a higher level where we need to be funded for other, other schools, right? So the issue is, when we're serious about this, when we really start to have a conversation, we'll start making some different choices, some different challenges. We have to recognize that, look, folks, I talk about this all the time. I am grateful for the folks who invested in me because by all intents and purposes, I said earlier, I should not be here. By only because of the grace of God, the folks who just saw something in me that I did not see in myself, that I stand here before you today. Same thing for folks like you in this room. Somebody saw something in you. I say this all the time. We are the products of other people's expectations. I say it again. We are the products of other people's expectations, right? Somebody expected you to be here. That's why you were here. Somebody laid the foundation for you to be here. Somebody sacrificed a whole hell of a lot for you to be here, right? We have got to ask ourselves the question, what is our legacy going to be? Are we going to be the generation that dropped the ball? Are we going to be the, the, the generation that, that, that could not pass the baton and put our situation, put our young people in a better situation than when we got the baton? We have to ask ourselves, what is our legacy? Because right now, if you talk to young people across this country, in cities like Delo cities like Wilmington, cities like, New uh, cities like New York, cities like Chicago, they are telling us that we are not listening that we are not learning from what they need and what they want. So the time is upon us to start to act bold, start to act brave, to start to act in some very courageous ways and do what's right on behalf of children. I maintain that oftentimes what happens in schools is that we as adults, we put adults' needs before we put children's needs, right? And we put adults' needs first, we put kids on the back burner, then kids lose and we lose. So I'm gonna ask you, I wanna thank you for doing what you do, investing in our young people, for being here and pushing and having those difficult conversations, having those courageous conversations, for being willing to say what other folks don't want to say, but what needs to be said, right? I want to thank you for being to be in a position to listen to folks in the trenches who feel like oftentimes nobody listens to their pain and their struggles and their stories. We have to begin to have folks who are willing to have those real life difficult conversations with our young people in the streets and in the, in, in, the, in the schools and in the communities and in their homes every single day. They are trying to convey a message to us that we are not serving them well. So as I close, I just want to give you one last charge. That charge is very plain and simple. When I was growing up in Compton, we would mess around with each other and we'd always tell folks, you know what? You say you're going to do something, I dare you. Right? And then somebody said, you don't think I'll do it? I said, not only will I dare you, I will double dare you, right? And then when the stakes got a little bit higher, what did you say? I triple dog dare you, right? So I'm going to triple dog dare everybody in this room to be committed to the work of public education for each and every child, not just the children who are in the more affluent communities, but for all the children in this state, all the children in this city, all the children across each of the districts here. I double dog, triple dog dare you to be the best we can be so we can engage in this important conversation. So I'll stop right there. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. And Dr. Uh, Howard has set the stage perfectly for us. So what we're going to do, the format is that each panelist will be given three minutes to provide an overview of vital information that they believe is significant to trends in urban education, specifically within the landscape of Wilmington. So we're going to start uh, with, the, with the overviews. Uh, then we have just a few questions, and, and we, then we will open it up to the audience. Uh, you can, make a, uh, you can pose a question to uh, any of the panelists, including um, Dr. Howard. You can make a comment, or you can offer an idea for action. Uh, we, we are going to ask that, that you keep your uh, comments, your ideas, or your question to uh, two minutes or less so that everyone can get a chance to participate in, in the conversation. Just, just to say just a little bit about the Wilmington context, uh, the Wilmington Education Advisory Committee that was appointed by uh, Governor Markell in 2014 uh, has made these wonderful books available 
So if you if you came in after they were distributed, be certain to, to get one. Um, this is is packed full of information, statistics, ideas, and it's an it's an action agenda. I just want to just read an excerpt uh, from the action agenda for Wilmington education. As you know, thousands of Wilmington children, most of them poor, black, or Latino, still do not have access to high quality public education. And judged on most outcomes, test scores, truancy, graduation rates, college attendance, socio, socio emotional well-being, drug use, homelessness, arrest, and unemployment, these children have become data points for a system of failure. Since uh, the summer of 2014, the level of confrontation about Wilmington education has escalated. Uh, Governor Jack Markell and the Delaware Secretary of Education, Mark Murphy, challenged two districts in particular to accept plans to transform six low-performing urban schools. The American Civil Liberties Union filed a claim with the U.S. Office of Civil Rights that the state's charter law has resegregated Wilmington schools. Uh, Wilmington Mayor Dennis P. Williams, uh, on behalf of the Office of Mayor, filed suit against the state of Delaware to hold open uh, to prevent the closing of Moyer Academic Institute, a charter school deemed by the Delaware Department of Education to be failing its students. Uh, Wilmington attracts unwanted national attention for our level of violent crime. Despite the allegations and the confrontations that now typify Wilmington education, the simple and undeniable historical fact is that our entire Delaware community is responsible. We in this room are all responsible. And only with the entire community acting together will the conditions that we are confronted with change. And it will not be easy. So now, in the words of the chairperson, Tony Allen, and I'm, again, this is an excerpt from the Strengthening Wilmington Education document that you have before you, the final report. Now is the time to act. It's the time to set Wilmington on, on a new course and a different path. And to do that, we must and we should and we must reduce the forces that divide us. Amen? So I would like to introduce to you Dr. Valencia Cade. Dr. Cade has played a quintessential role in leading reform and turnaround efforts in several states. Vi, raise your hand so they know who you are. Okay. Her doctoral studies focused on restructuring low-performing urban schools. She is currently the senior director of secondary education in the Christina School District. She intimately learned about the complex challenges facing urban education from her experiences as a teacher, assistant principal, principal, and district office administrator in both New York City and Chicago public schools. Dr. Cade is an overcomer. She excelled beyond personal circumstances, including being placed in foster care and having a learning disability. Today, she is representing the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. Please welcome Dr. Kate. I want to introduce to some and reintroduce to most of you our city councilman, Anamdi Chakwocha. Did I get it right, Anamdi? Okay. <laughs> oh, I've been practicing <laughs> for about 15 years now. <laughs> uh, councilman Namdi is an MSW. He's been a Wilmington City Councilman for the first district and the chair of the Education, Youth, and Families Committee uh, for three years. Uh, he has over 30 years of direct service experience working both within the youth and family development arena in schools and in the community-based settings. So you have their bios, but he is much, much more than, than, than all of them are. He is a father, he is a husband, he is a staunch advocate, for people that feel that they do not have a voice. He is an internationally renowned spoken word artist, he and his brother, the Twin Poets. Please welcome Councilman Namdi Chukwocha. <laughs> Dr. David Clark Jr. serves as the board president of Education Voices. He currently serves as the chief executive officer of one of the largest charter schools in the country in Chester. Dr. Clark began his career as a social worker 33 years ago. 
He later transitioned into education as a special education teacher, assistant principal, principal, director of education, and director of special education. Dr. Clark earned his doctorate degree in education, innovation, and leadership from Wilmington University. Please uh, welcome again Dr. David Clark, Jr. And he's sharp, uh, sharp like his daddy. <laughs> Shannon Griffin. Shannon works with the ACLU of Delaware as a community project organizer. Her work focuses on ending excessive use of discipline actions in our schools. Prior to working with ACLU, she was the executive director and founder of the Learning Link of Delaware, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving academic achievement of Delaware's children by facilitating connections among families, communities, and schools. Dr. Griffin is a passionate advocate for parents and students, dedicating over 15 years of supporting school, community-based, and faith-based organizations, and assisting parents in understanding their rights and responsibilities within the public education system. Uh, uh, Ms. Griffin holds a master's degree in organizational management and leadership uh, from Springfield College. Please welcome Shannon Griffin. <laughs> Dr. Jacqueline D. Jenkins oh. <laughs> serves as a chief strategy advisor to Mayor Dennis P. Williams. Currently, Dr. Jenkins has the responsibility for the city's education initiative. Previously, she served as the Human Resources Director for the City of Wilmington and the Delaware Technical and Community College. In short, while Dr. Jenkins has quickly learned uh, that educating our children requires a holistic approach by supporting and engaging families and strengthening community partnerships, Dr. Jenkins believes our schools should anchor and unite our neighborhoods. She has a compassion for young people and early learners and is committed to education and mentorship. She is the founder of the Women's Empowerment and Mentoring Alliance and the Youth Empowerment and Mentoring Alliance. Dr. Jenkins holds a doctorate degree in educational leadership with a focus in, po in policy and administration from the University of, of Delaware. So please welcome all of our panelists. So, Francine, you ready? Francine has the tes has the has the, uh, the timer. So when you hear, the, is it going to make a sound? Okay. All right. So we will we begin with uh, the opening statement uh, that Dr. Valencia Kate would like to share with us. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Right. Good morning, everyone. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. And today, I will be representing the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. Our mission is to make measurable impact on the community by advocating on behalf of black women and black girls through strategic alliances that promote public policy agendas related to health, education, leadership development, gender equity, and economic development. I'm gonna start with a quote from uh, Marion Wright Elderman, who is uh, the leader of the Children's Defense Fund. Quote, unquote, the greatest threat to America's economic, military, and national security comes from no enemy without, but from our failure unique among high-income nations to invest adequately and fairly in health, education, and sound development of all of our young. Black girls are confronted with a plethora of factors that are historical, institutional, and social that increase their risk of underachievement and disengagement from school. According to the Wilmington Education Advisory Committee's uh, report, which was released in April of 2015, Data of 2013 suggests that 70% of Wilmington students qualify for low income resources. 34% of the children in the city of Wilmington from the age of through zero through 18 live in poverty. Yeah. Unemployment in the city of Wilmington in 2013 was 13.5%. 
25% of the children living in homes in the city of Wilmington were a part of female-headed households. When we compared the graduation rate of 2014 for children in Wilmington and with the state of Delaware, we saw the graduation rate for children in Wilmington was 69% compared to the entire state, which was 84%. According to Dr. Yasser Payne of the University of Delaware's research called the People's Report, he provides evidence that children attending schools in the city of Wilmington are impacted by, quote, physical violence, which is deeply tied to profound notions of structural inequalities. There are two issues that are relevant to black girls in high need schools. It's the underachievement rate and the increasing concern regarding black girls in the school to prison pipeline. Today, I want to argue that to support high quality education for black girls in the city of Wilmington and all children, we must focus on compassion, capacity, community, and commitment. Trauma and adversity are the elephants in the room. It's hard for black girls or any child to calculate math or any other subject when they're trying to calculate when they're going to get their next meal or where they're going to sleep. I remember the article from September the 13th, 2013, when it tied up, when the news journal wrote, uh, teen girls so fair in the Wilmington Hilltop neighborhood. I remember the rumblings of the YOLO uh, gang. Uh, so according to a report, a national report, that talks about black girls matter, uh, black girls are six times more likely to be suspended than their white female counterparts. So this issue of black girls is a true issue which is directly connected to the issues of black boys in our community and it's relevant to the city of Wilmington. Thank you. Did she leave some time on the table? <laughs> well. <laughs> okay. Councilman Chuck Wocha. Thank you, Sister Ray. First, I just wanted to uh, wish my Sister Ray a, a happy birthday coming up on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. And she is, is truly the, the epitome of um, what I hope to be. I mean, as far as artistically, nonprofit, education, and, and just truly helping to prepare the next generation of leaders. I mean, preparing us and, and truly realizing how important succession is in our communities and in our organizations. So thank you. Um, what, thank you, Shirley. And what I wanted to just mention, I, I guess what, when I thought about three minutes, uh, I wanted to do a poem and they let me do that later. So, uh, but I, I thought about education and me, myself, being uh, one of the last products of the Wilmington School District. You know, I, I'm, I think it was just two classes that came in under me. So I did kindergarten first and second grade in the Wilmington School District. And I remember growing up on um, Vanderbilt Avenue right outside of uh, Riverside. And we, we just walked to school. My, my, my parents work, both worked in that community. So that was what life was, meant to me. I mean, you talk about community schools. We worked there. We lived there. This was what it meant. And then all of a sudden, in, in, in 78, things changed. And we actually moved. We moved to 26th Street, and we still went to, to Martin Luther King School. And, and, and nowadays, that, that would mean going from Colonial District through Barney Island, ending up in Red Clay. But we, we stayed in the Wilmington School District, and we just walked up 26th Street and walked down 30th and, and went to school. And I know that wouldn't happen today, but that's what we did. And that what it gave us, that sense of understanding and that sense of pride. But in, in 78, when we ended up going to out Kirkwood Highway going to Heritage. We, we had a foundation in us because I had, I, I knew what schooling meant. I, I knew what, how my teachers were supposed to treat me. So I knew what it felt like when I didn't receive that treatment. I knew when everyone that got off that bus, we felt like we were treated differently and, and, and how that impacted me up for, for that school year and, and how I didn't realize what was missing, but I knew something was missing. It, it def definitely was a difference in, in my whole adult life has honestly been spent in that, that very community trying to work with schools to improve the relationships between the, the home, the, the schools, and the community. And now being on, on council and, and being involved in this education fight, I, I truly understand the role that the city needs to play, understanding that we, we have to have that voice rather, and it went through our, our Office of Education and, and Public Policy 
and for us to realize that we are our voice is needed to speak for for our children we have to begin to develop this this agenda for for city action and city leadership on behalf of our our children our communities and and our parents that are truly looking toward us for for that assistance and for our the way in which i, I see one of the the roles is for us to play is through the education alliance where we bring all of our schools together and we begin to share success and we we assist our schools with generating additional resources and supports that they need to, to run the, the programs that we all know are needed to support our, our children uh, such as the arts and, and music and after school programs so that that's the, the focus i believe and i i thank city council president uh for for really honing in and, and letting education be a priority for this council thank you Thank you. Our councilman is a member of the Wilmington Education Advisory Committee. Just want to make sure that you all are aware of that. Shannon Griffin. Thank you all, and I want to thank also Councilman President Gregory for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I have been in this work for, I guess, almost close to 20 years now. My most recent position, as um, Ray alluded to, was with the um, ACLU of Delaware. And I'm working on this, this uh, same uh, problem we talked about earlier, the school to prison pipeline. And just so we're really clear what we're talking about, when we look at the school to prison pipeline, it is a mirror of what we're ha what's happening in our criminal justice system with regard to um, people being arrested, black and brown po folks being arrested for low level um, crimes. When we look at our schools, 68% of all suspensions are for low level offenses. 68%. So we are repeatedly suspending kids for things like being late to class, late to school, dress code violations, having a cell phone, disrespect toward a teacher, disrespect toward another student. These are low level things. And this really speak to what Dr. Howard meant, uh, said so eloquently earlier. It's about relationships. Because more than 80% of these incidents are happening in the classroom. So it's what's happening or rather not happening between student and teacher there's a breakdown there that we really need to address with regard to relationships and understanding and expectations. And so we believe that the work that I'm doing with ACLU through the Coalition for Equity, for Equity and um, Coalition for Fairness and Equity in Schools, uh, we want to change that. We have to change that through policy. When we look at the codes of conduct, um, that the, and this is what the policies that they're using to base these suspensions on, we have to eliminate that. And we know that it can be done. We're looking at what's happening around the country. Baltimore City Schools, for just an example, last year uh, voted to eliminate uh, suspensions for low-level offenses. It's being done in Denver. It's being done in some school districts in Los Angeles. And we believe it can happen here. If we can stem the tide of what's happening from a low-level um, um, perspective, we believe it'll, it's, a, it's a ripple effect. When only 2% of, of major uh, incidences, what's happening, uh, what kids are being suspended for, things like fighting and drugs. That's only 2%. If we can really address what's happening at the minor level, we believe it, we, it, it's, it, it'll be a domino effect in what can happen um, elsewhere. But uh, we have to address the policies that are, that are driving this. And he, Dr. Howard also alluded to the point that we need to uh, show up in mass. It's not enough that I come you know, that Ray and her group comes, that Dr. Gregory and his group comes. We have to come together collectively if we're going to see some serious change. We need to bombard um, Leg Hall in Dover. We need, to, we need to bombard city council. We need to bombard school, school board members. When we look at what happened recently with the vote in Red Clay, um, there was only two candidates, I believe, that ran. And in the second, a larger school district, only 500 people voted. We have a serious apathy that's happening, and we need to reconnect, re-energize our communities so we can drive for some serious change. <laughs> Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Ray. Unlike my fellow panelists, I had to uh, put my notes on paper so that I can stay on task. The one thing you don't do is give a minister a microphone and expect them to <laughs> adhere to the time frame. Uh, what I'd like to say is what I lack in formal instruction in the area of education and practical experience, I make up in personal experience because a long time ago I was one of these children. In the short time that I've had this role <clears throat> in working with the schools, working with school leaders, teachers, and students themselves, I've learned what's needed. 
and the mayor's vision for education is a student success model that is partnership focused because we know that it truly takes a village to raise a child. Education is the key to improving the lives of students and families, strengthening neighborhoods, and growing our city. We recognize that families are our first partners, and, we are the, and they are the continuing educators of our children, which is why family engagement is so important. Family school partnerships are critical to improving student motivation and learning. Those same partnerships also strengthen the connection between our schools and our community partners to include business leaders in our faith-based community because our children are all of our responsibilities. Enhanced health and wellness services in our schools to function as the wraparound service hub for all of our children is a priority for the mayor. Moving the needle from thinking learning begins at age five to understanding learning begins at birth at age zero. Brains are built, they're not born. Closing the readiness gap of our kindergartners by continuing to support the Wilmington Early Care and Education Council whose mission is to increase the academic success of our children in Wilmington by enhancing the quality of early care and education opportunities for children birth to age five, moving away from the babysitting model. We also have just begun to establish a partnership with the Delaware Readiness Teams who support early learning in addition to the state's Office of Early Care and Education. We need to attract qualified seasoned teachers who understand the needs of our children. We recognize as a city, we must ensure our neighborhoods are safe to lessen that recruitment challenge. And these needs, we need to focus on the alarming rate that our children are dropping out of schools and the disproportionate numbers that our children are being suspended and hopefully our partnerships with the Red Clay uh, will help us to yield strategies to implement programs. Our Parks and Recreation Department uh, works to improve the college and career readiness of our high school seniors with initiatives like our SAT prep program, Youth in Government, and our annual college tour. We must offer more out of school programs. We're working to offer more out, uh, summer and uh, out of school, after school programs with educational enrichment component to avoid that summer slide that occurs each summer when our children are out of school. Remember, out of sight, out of mind. And lastly, mentoring. There is no greater feeling than giving back. If you are not a mentor, please, please, please consider becoming a mentor. The attention you offer and the reward and personal satisfaction you receive is beyond measure. My time is up. I see the panel waving, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Clark. Thank you. Can you hear? Thank you. Is it Thank you. Can you hear me? Nope. Can you just I'm pass him your mic? Yep. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've uh, been in education now for a while, and um, I am CEO of a charter school in Chester. Chesterbury like, is similar to women's and just up the road. Same issues when it comes to uh, student learning and student performance and, and just, you know, just working with children with behavior issues and challenging behavior issues. And Dr. Howard alluded to this, and this, this process, this solution, or the solutions, if you will, are really simple solutions. The question is as to whether we're going to carry out or not. What determines whether a child's going to be successful in a classroom? It's not the curriculum. It's not technology, right? It's the relationship that the teacher has with the student, period. That's going to determine whether the child is successful or not in a brick and mortar charter school. In my schools, there, we have 212 teachers. Out of the 212 teachers, that's just the teachers alone, but out of the 212 teachers, there's only about 10 African American teachers. Now, I'm not saying you have to be African American to teach black children of color, I'm not saying that, but it just, it's a reflection of this country. It's, and I've had situations where our teachers did not hold our students with, to high expectations. They just didn't. They didn't hold them high. But they thought they were, but they really, really weren't. And so the challenge is to get the right person, to get the right teacher in front of our students and or to train those teachers. And this begins in colleges. 
And I don't, I'm not sure about what's going on in curriculum in colleges in order for them to really understand diversity and understand our children. I just don't think it's there because I see what's coming in the, into the schools. That's a challenge. The other thing is, this is so important, trauma, wraparound services. You can't expect a child to come into the classroom when somebody just got shot in the community. It doesn't have to be their relative. That's trauma. It's trauma, and it, and it manifests itself in other ways. We have a lot of trauma in our schools. I'm feeling it. And I know the children are feeling it. So how, what are we really doing to address trauma? You can't isolate or you can't separate education from health services. You can't separate the two. You can't. The, the other thing is, the other thing is this testing thing, right? All right, there was a question asked, well, what to do, what, what should we do about working with kids who need, who need additional help? Well, this testing thing is taken out of way. You know, there's a difference between testing and there's a difference between getting some diagnostic information, like you go into the doctor, you want to know specifically what it is so we can treat it. Well, that's the same thing with education. So this testing thing is going beyond what's best for students. And, and one additional thing, we need to bring the arts and music back in to schools. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. So yes. When, when people talk about, well, that's it. <laughs> All right, well, I got that last one in anyway. Dr. Cade. The plight of black girls in high need schools. What specific recommendations are you identifying um, that are likely to support eradicating some of these conditions that impact achievement and attainment for black girls? And if you, if you have one or two models um, that are demonstrating success in similar populations as Wilmington, would you share that with us? Sure, I think um, we'd start by um first identifying that we need perhaps some gender specific programs. I think one of the biggest challenges when we're dealing with, you're not hearing me yet, can you hear me now? Okay. One of the biggest challenges is that um, when I did the research and I looked at this national report uh, on Black Girls Matter being over uh, police um, and, you know, I learned that the alarming rate of black girls being suspended and being pushed out of school, uh, that there was a limited body of research out there on the issues and problems pertaining to black girls. So that's one issue, that we need to do some viable research locally here in the state of Delaware, in the city of Wilmington, to disaggregate that data and really look at the issues and the challenges that black girls are having. Um, so that's one thing. Gender-specific programs are always important. Um, you know, we had the Reach Academy for Girls, and we need programs that focus specifically on girls. One of the biggest issues that our girls really deal with in terms of some of the dynamics that they have to confront is the issue of teen pregnancy. We know that, according to this report, that out of uh, the girls who are pregnant that are black, that are teenagers nationally, 51% of them, only 51% of them graduate by the time they're 22. This is a big gender-specific issue. So what are the services and programs like DAPI? How do we build partnerships with uh, uh, school districts? I know in my district, uh, our supervisor for parent and community engagement, Whitney Williams, works with teen pregnant girls in the schools, and we convene different groups. I know the organizations that I'm a part of, the National Coalition for 100 Black Women, we go into schools and provide mentoring programs for girls. One of our programs in Howard High School is the 100 Bridges programs. So we need programs that are specific to gender issue problems. But this issue of trauma, it is a real issue. Many, our ki many of our kids in the city of Wilmington, according to the People's Report by Dr. Yasser Payne, when they uh, had a community, like a participatory research project around East Side, um, East Side community in South Bridge, where they had interviewed over 500 participants. Of the 500 participants that they interviewed, 51% of them had indicated that they had been slapped, kicked, punched. And so this issue of physical violence in our communities has to be dealt with in our schools. Our school uh, educators are not trained for these services. So we have to have models like Compassionate Schools, which is a national model that comes out of Washington State that deals with trauma-informed education. These programs deal with providing support to students and their families to help eradicate the issues around working with the social-emotional needs of children. You can't teach me unless you know my issues. 
I was sitting at a presentation that Dr. Howard did, I think, two weeks ago. And he had this conceptual framework that talked about know, care, and act. And in the conceptual framework, he talked about various different fa factors that deal with um, racial and cultural awareness, but also understanding the social political pieces that children bring to school that we have to deal with. So we have to have programs that deal with the issues that our kids, kids are bringing to school. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You can clap. Do you mind if I call them by their first name? I know everybody <laughs> except for her, except for Dr. Howard, and I'm and, and now I know you too. Um, but uh, Shannon, the ACLU has done significant research regarding discipline disparities uh, in regards to African American children. Um, tell us what is meant by restorative practices. Uh, Everybody doesn't know what that means. I don't, I don't really know what it means. What is meant by restorative practices and outline the role that you believe restorative practices play in, remedy, in remedying some of the complexities that have been uncovered? Okay, so when we look at uh, what's happening in our schools and we look at what's happening by race in our schools, we know that um, black boys are three to four times more likely to be suspended uh, than their white counterparts. Um, our Hispanic uh, boys are two times as likely to be suspended. Um, and when we talk about alternatives to suspension, so it's like, well, you know, you have to be able to, folks have to be accountable, they have to take responsibility, and we believe that's true as well. Um, but we want to take a more restorative approach. So what that basically means, it's restoring harm. It's allowing the victim to be able to um, speak directly with the person that, that they were victimized by. It's allowing both parties to come together and mutually um, address an issue. And sometimes it's with a mediator, um, a peer mediator. Sometimes it's with a uh, teacher leader or even a parent a mediator. And it's a way to restore the harm in a way that doesn't push students out or exclude them. So for instance, if a student uh, did something, you know, they started a, a, a fight or something or started, um, they were in a cafeteria and they threw food or whatever. So instead of suspending that, that student for two or three days, that student would have to be made to provide restitution. So they need to clean up the cafeteria for two or three days, right? So they're still going to class, but they need to, you know, res restore what they did. So we're saying that, you know, and these approaches are not anything that's, you know, mind blowing. It's anything that's really new or innovative. It's been happening across the country. And we want to bring that to bear in a more systemic way so that all schools are doing it. So it doesn't make a difference that, you know, if your teacher happened to go to a specific training over the summer that talked about restorative, where well, her classroom may have it, but none of the other teachers in the classroom does, uh, in, the, in the school building uh, has that. So we're talking about training where all of our schools, all of our stu teachers, all of our administrators understand what this restorative practice means and how it can be done um, in the classroom. Um, councilmen, public servants play a vital role in ensuring that legislators and, and our constituents and your constituents understand our children's needs, both within the context of public education and the broader context of their lives. What, what systems are in place so that regular ordinary people like me and like parents that, that, we, that we know that there is a two-way communication and sustained dialogue between constituents, elected officials, and public school leaders. I think a, a lot of it to me, I mean, there are definitely gaps in those systems. I mean, when we think about um, President Gregory's and, and the other visions for EVI, which created that to address one of those gaps, but I think some of the methods that, that are available, there are a, a few in our city, a few true advocates who are really trying to bridge those gaps and to, to work with parents. I know on, as far as city council, our, our true drive through our Education, Youth, and Families Committee has been to provide that outright education and, and make sure that, that the barriers of communication and that the information is being passed on. We've held multiple education forums. We, we, we make sure that we, we engage, you know, for 
all anyone who wants to come speak before our committee, they, they give that opportunity and, and pass the information out. And that all of our, our civic associations, our neighborhood planning councils, that, that they're all aware of what we're trying to do the, as far as the, our education agenda for our, our city. We realize that it's going to take a, a, a vision for all of us. And, and we, we can't move forward. You know, there's a buzzword. I, I don't care if you're writing the grant about horticulture or you're, you're writing the grant about financial literacy, there's a, a, a word that everybody's using in their grant now, this, this engagement word. And as far as parent engagement, community engagement, what we're trying to do is really keep our community engaged. And I think that's, a, well, as we see going forward, will be a big role of our Office of, of um, Education and Public Policy, as well as our education, uh, political, I mean, uh, educational alliance with our schools, working with our schools to truly bring parents into the, the, the role and not just thinking that it's the parents' responsibilities because as elected officials, th this is surely uh, our primary, we're, we are here to represent our, our constituents and as whether we want to blame it on the school boards or this or that, we, we have a role to play because it's about accountability and before we can hold anyone else accountable, we as a city must begin to hold ourselves accountable for what, what we need to do and that's to develop that a true action agenda for our city and, and to fulfill that leadership role for education. Thank you. So, thank you, Councilman. So when, when are your education uh, committee meetings? Our education committee meetings are held the second Wednesday of every month. We meet in the um, workshop room and they're, they're held at 4.30, I mean, I'm sorry, at 5 o'clock. The second Wednesday of second each month, five, five o'clock, and they are open to the public, yes. and, and, your, and your voice is, is, is needed. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, in, uh, in the Wilmington um, Education Advisory Committee plan, there are recommendations. I'm addressing this to anybody that wants to respond. There are recommendations. There is a recommendation uh, uh, with several points to it to streamline governance, to to make a more coherent, more cohesive system of education. As you know, our students are educated in four different districts. Um, then when you overlay charter schools, uh, unless they have been um, approved by a district, they are districts in themselves. So we have 17 different governing systems uh, for 11, almost 11,000 to 12,000 children. Have you ever heard of such a thing? It's unheard of. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so, there, so there is a recommendation, one of the recommendations is to remove, um, it's about 2,400 children from the Christina School District and reassign them to the Red Clay School District. And I, I would just like for to hear um, just, you know, your honest um, uh, response to, to that recommendation. Uh, the point, as I understand it, is, is to streamline the number of school districts that our children go to with the hope that we can have a more concerted effort in improving educational outcomes. But I would like to have your, except for you, you can't speak on that. Because we want her to have her job when she go back on Monday. So uh, <laughs> uh, everyone else. I, I want to speak on it. Can okay. I? Um, the, the issue of streamlining is, it, the concept is great. But my question would be, especially as an outsider looking in, well, what about quality? You know, I mean, what's going to be different if they move to red clay from whatever school district they're moving from? I mean, what are they going to offer? What kind of resources are going to be available to make it a better situation? Because that's what this is all about. You know, what about the quality? So I asked that question. I don't know. I, I don't know what their intent is in terms of resources, in terms of funding. I don't know how the money travels with the child, and I don't know what that's going to do for city children. It also says to me that it's in direct opposition to us working, having our own thing. So, you know, having some control into what goes on with our children in the city. So those are, those are my initial comments. So just um, looking from the outside, I guess um, someone said it earlier, we're talking about a district, we're talking about roughly 12,000 students. That's fixable, that's doable. I'm, I'm at a place where we've got 700,000 students. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I see 12,000, I'm saying you've got to understand this can be fixed. But I do think, you know, you've got to follow the money. And part of the challenge is when, when folks try to reallocate, redesign, it typically has some financial implications associated with them. And this is where folks have got to get out and knock on doors and get residents to come out and help inform them about what is happening and to help them to understand how this can affect their children, their schools, their neighborhoods. And so it, it requires some advocacy and talking to folks and informing folks and mobilizing folks and or, organizing folks to get out to have them to understand what they can do to make sure that when these restructurings 
uh, uh, steps occur, they occur in ways that don't put folks at a disadvantage. Since, since I know some of the inner thinking of the commission, I want to tell you what their thinking is. That is, with one eliminating colonial, which is only coming out of uh, Riverside, and eliminating uh, Christina, and only having the one district, that being uh, uh, Brandywine, and then Red Clay, Red Brandywine, and then we have Red Clay that's already here, with a better chance of understanding the nuances of education in two districts versus four. Also, if you want to, we accept it, it's accurate that Red Clay has failed our kids as well as uh, Christina. However, the thinking, the thinking is that we have a better shot with fixing it through Red Clay than through Christina. Now you can debate if that's accurate or not, but that is the thinking. So streamlining is going from four to two, and you pick the one that you think would be more amenable. Now, so that you know, uh, Brandwine has weighed in on it and said, no, wait a minute. We would like to have more urban kids too. We were very surprised that they, that, that would be their thinking. But also the thinking was, when you look at legislators from the various, that represent the various districts, and you look at the communities that the various districts serve, where would you get the better pushback? If you're at war, do you want two fronts or one front? So the thinking was, let's have one front, not from the commission standpoint, because I've talked to them, we, let's have one front, that would be the red clay front, we can get it through, but we don't have the resources or capacity to fight on two fronts, that is both Brandywine and uh, red clay. And of course, Christina, their leadership, would, their leadership, some of their leadership would love to get us out because they don't want the urban students there, so their motives maybe are different. But now Red Clay is saying, yes, we would take the students, and presumably if we get to, if they get to Brandwine taking the students, there's one stipulation, Dr. Clark, and that is, what are gonna be the extra resources? We need extra resources that we give with smaller class sizes, incentives for better teachers, so there are some incentives that we need, or we're not going for this now. I'm not on the commission, but I thought it would be fair since I had some insight knowledge as to their thinking that I would share it with you, uh, and yet you wouldn't be talking about it in a vacuum. Thank you.